So usually I'm on this stage with a guitar, and I'm not going to lie to you, it kind of feels weird not having a guitar and being on this stage. Um, so I wanted to kind of share with you how I got here without a guitar, as many of you are probably wondering. Uh, so Pastor Brad, Pastor Brian, Pastor Jose, and myself were sitting in a, in a meeting a few months back, and we were talking about the upcoming sermon series. And we were praying, and we were asking the Holy Spirit, Lord, just put on our heart what the series are going to be. And we spent time in prayer about this, and we came into this meeting and we said, you know what, we're going to tackle the topic of love in February because it's the month of love, right? We got Valentine's Day. And so we decided that that's the direction we were going to go. And we were going to talk about marriage specifically because in today's society, the church needs to be talking about marriage. Amen? So we're sitting there and we're talking and I, I kind of spoke up and I said, hey guys, I said, can we just do one thing? This is all I asked. I said, I love the idea of talking about marriage, spending a whole sermon series on it. But I said, can we just make sure that we talk about singleness? Because I'm the only single pastor. And so sometimes I feel the weight that not necessarily our church, but the church as a whole tends to cater a lot of times towards married couples, right? So we have our potluck dinners that we have for marriages. Um, we have, you know, sermon series. We have events. We have date nights and all these things. And so I said, I just want to make sure, and they were totally on board. They were like, yes, let's do this. Let's not be the church that leaves out that group of people. And I myself am in that group of people. But what happened was, is everybody got quiet for a second. They all kind of nodded with me. And then one by one, they began to turn and look at me. And there was about a 15-second period, and that's all it took for me to go, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We get singled out, pun intended. Like, come on, you know. <laughs> But they said, you know what, why don't, Stephen, why don't you preach this message? And I said, good, because I've been practicing this for a while. So <laughs> let's go. I'm qualified for it. But I'm so excited to be here with you this morning, and I'm excited to be talking about singleness. And, and so what, what I want to do is um, I, want, I have a rose here, and I'm going to pass this to you here. And I'm going to ask that you just look at it for a second and then pass it along. And what I want to do is I want to pass that rose all throughout my talk. And I want everybody to get a chance to look at it. So put that aside. Let's move forward. All right. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to dive into God's word this morning. Father, we love you, and we're just excited to be here, God, in your presence. We're excited to be able to come here together as a church body, as the body of Christ, to worship your name and say that you are holy. And Lord, I just ask that you be with us during this time. Fill our spirits during this time. Give us open ears, open hearts to what you have to say. Let my words not be my own, but of your Holy Spirit, Lord. We love you, and we praise you. It's in your name. We pray, amen. amen. So for those of you who know me, I'm Stephen. I'm the youth and worship pastor here at HCC. And I come from the great state of Georgia. <laughs> come on, y'all. Come on. So you're going to hear me say y'all a lot in my sermon. Um, but I come from the great state of Georgia. I lived about 45 minutes south of Atlanta. And for the past five years, I've owned a motorcycle. And I rode my motorcycle in Georgia. And I had this rule. I lived on, anybody ever driven through Atlanta? Okay, so you know how crazy it can be. I lived on exit 47, okay? Next up was 49 if you're going northbound, then 51. That was my cutoff zone for my bike. I said, I'm never going to go past exit 51. Because once you cross 51, you're starting to get north, towards metro, and it was just a dangerous zone to ride a motorcycle in. So I lived my life in Georgia saying, I'm just going to stop at 51. The entire time I was there, never crossed 51 on my bike. I came down to South Florida, and I brought my motorcycle, and I tell you what, I thought I knew what crazy driving and roadways looked like, <laughs> and then I moved down here. And let me tell you, you guys here have made Atlanta look like the kitty track at Disney World. <laughs> really. And so, uh, so one night, I get down here, and I just got my motorcycle, and I was like, you know what, I'm going to take a ride, I'm going to go, it's a beautiful night, we don't get to ride motorcycles in Atlanta in December. And um, so I said, you know what, I'm going to go for a, for a ride up to see a friend in West Palm Beach. Uh, first mistake. Um, <laughs> so I get on my motorcycle, it was about 9 o'clock at night, and I go down Sheridan Street. I get on North 95, uh, and immediately within 30 seconds I felt regret. And I look around and I literally started to verbally say in my helmet, Jesus, be with me because I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to make it to West Palm Beach. This is a horrible idea. What was I thinking? Like, what was I thinking? I should know better. So I took all those years of practicing not going past exit 51 and just threw them out the window. And so I'm riding up to West Palm, and I'm sitting there, and I'm going, Lord, protect me. Blood of Jesus be over me. And 
I began to try and decide how I'm going to conquer this journey to get to West Palm Beach. And what I did is I picked a lane, the, the lane right beside the HOV, the fast lane. So here's that lane. I go in this lane. And I said, you know what, as long as I stay in one lane, I'm just going to kind of cruise at my set, my set speed, and I'm going to make it. I'm going to make it there. And so every once in a while, I would come up on a slow car, and I'd be like, oh, they're going like 10 miles under the speed limit. I could pass them. And I'd, I'd get so tempted to, and I'd look over, and right before I'd get over, I'd just see a car go flying by. And I'm like, nope, no, 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 no. You know what? Okay, God. Okay. I got you. I'm going to stay in my lane. And I began to think as I was asked to talk about this talk what does singleness look like? And that's exactly what I think singleness looks like. It looks like traveling to a destination, marriage, and wanting to arrive there safely. And a lot of times what happens is, is we don't focus on arriving there safely. We want to get to our destination fast by getting in the HOV lane. And what might happen is, is we might miss the person that merges onto the highway and goes at the same speed with us. And we may end up at the destination with the wrong person. So that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. Is we're going to be talking about what it looks like to travel on the highway of life, if you're single, towards the destination of marriage and getting there safely. But I'm going to also be speaking to two other groups of people and those that have maybe found themselves in a path to singleness later in life. Maybe you started out going through, the, through marriage and now you're single. So we're going to be talking to you. And then also, I want to address marriages. And so what I don't want to happen is I don't want, if you're married, just to check out right now. So don't leave yet. I promise we'll get there. But first, we're going to talk about singleness. And so the title of this sermon is going to be Stay in Your Lane, because I think that's the most important thing we could do, is stay in our lane. We're going to uh, look at what the Bible says about singleness, and actually it has a lot to say about it, and Paul addresses it in 1 Corinthians seven twenty-five through 35. It says, now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. And those who mourn as though they, had, they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing. And those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free of anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So I read this as a single man and go, wow, that's horrible news. <laughs> I want to get married. And Paul just says, don't get married. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for everybody that wants to get married? And I started to dive into the passage. I started to pray about it. And that's not what Paul is saying in this passage. He's not saying don't get married. The key that we have to tune into is the very last verse, which says, secure your undivided attention on the Lord. Devotion to the Lord. That's what this passage is about. It doesn't say, you know what, Stephen, you have a passion, you have a desire to get married one day, don't go chase that. What it does say is when you chase that, keep Jesus in the focus. Don't just bypass God and find who you want, find who Jesus has for you. And so you see, so many times in life, people get it wrong. Uh, we, we go through and we list off who we want, right? So... There was a website called Match.com that was created. It was one of the first big dating websites. And they had an algorithm where you go in and you put everything you want. And you put what color hair of the future relationship do you want? What color, you know, whatever, eyes. And then it shows you these matches and hopefully you find somebody you're compatible with and, you know, you pursue a relationship via finding them online. And... It wasn't working, and they did a study, and it was showing that people didn't make it past the first date. 
And so they brought in a professional and they said, why is this happening? And he said, because you're picking everything you want, but what you're not picking is the flaws that are going to come. And you see, we, they were so focused on who they want, they forgot that people have baggage, people have flaws. And when you stop focusing on Jesus and start focusing on the person, those flaws are going to come out. And when those flaws come out, they're going to destroy relationships, they're going to destroy marriages because Jesus is not in the center. You see, the first point that I'm going to make today is that you've got to focus on Jesus, not marriage. I mean, don't get me wrong, guys. I want to get married one day, but my focus can't be there because I may not make it to the destination, A, with the right person or safely. And I want to do both of those things. So I'd rather travel on my highway of life a little bit longer than end up at the destination wrongly. Levi Lusco says it like this in his book called Swipe Right. It's on uh, the power of dating, sex, and marriage. And he says, it's better to remain in a season of singleness longer than to marry the wrong person. What a true statement. What a true statement. So I wanted to figure out how this looked if we, if we uh, get a visual on this, right? So we have this cup here represents man, this represents woman. Now, if you notice something about these cups, I don't know if you can see it, but they have holes in them because of sin. We're broken, right? So... What happens is, is a cup's purpose in a cup's life is to hold water. But when you pour water into a broken cup, it can't fulfill its purpose. When we're created, we're born into sin, and until Jesus intervenes in our life, we can't fulfill our purpose. And then what happens is, is along comes a spouse, and Jesus still isn't in the picture, and these cups end up together in marriage, and the water goes in the cup, And it begins to just pour right out as well because they cannot fulfill their calling. So when you put two broken pieces together, it doesn't make a whole. It remains broken. But what happens when we put Jesus in the picture? Something that is whole, something that is pure, something that is perfect, something that redeems us. The cup holds water. So this is what it looks like when a person is chasing Jesus and has them in their focus. It looks like purpose. And then along comes a spouse, but maybe that spouse isn't focused on Jesus like the other person, and maybe they're unequally yoked, and they want to be with that person and not with Jesus, what's going to happen is, is the water just gets pushed out of the other person. They're going to get drained. The only way for this to work is if Jesus is in the center. That is the only way that all three cups can hold water. And without him in the center, it's just going to continue to leak every time. (laughs) All over my iPad. So... That right there is how we should live our lives, with Jesus in the center. Because when that time comes, and it will come, where you find a future spouse if you're single, if you stay faithful and follow Jesus' commands with him in the center, he's going to bless that. Don't stray from it. You see, this includes boundaries. And we're talking about relationships, and we got to cover boundaries. The Bible defines them very clearly in 1 Corinthians 6.18. It says, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And then that follows with 2 Timothy 2.22, which says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Notice that last part right there. Those who call on the Lord with a pure heart. That's what this looks like. He's saying flee from keeping me out of the picture. Flee from sexual immorality. Don't go down that road. So many people today are having troubles in relationships, and then you sit there and you read that passage, and they're not even living that. And so typically what will happen is, is people will turn to God and say, God, just please, like, help me, help me. I love this person. I want to be with them. And then you look at their history together, and they're not even honoring God in their relationship. How is he going to bless something that he's not being honored in? And so we have to, as we're engaging in relationships, focus on 2 Timothy uh, 2.22 and focus on 1 Corinthians 6.18. And we have to get away from sexual immorality. And we have to keep Jesus on the focus. These cups are a representation of what that looks like, that brokenness, that sin. And again, it just won't work. It will always leak. So what does that exactly look like? The brokenness, the sexual immorality. Um, some of you might have seen these X's on my hands and know I was not at a club last night. 
Um, just wanted to clear that up <laughs> before I don't have a job on Monday. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so so I, I drew these on my hand because recently there's a, there's a movement called End It Movement, and it's to bring awareness to modern day human trafficking. And there's 27 million people right now that are enslaved in captivity that are being human trafficked for labor and, and sex. And we have the privilege of living in South Florida and don't always see that view. So this movement is dedicated to bringing awareness and raising funds to combat human trafficking. And I couldn't help but think, because this day, launch day of this movement, the, the, the whole like anniversary of it was the other day, and so I drew the X's on my hands, and um, everybody's taking pictures and putting them on social media, and it's going all over the nation. And I couldn't help but think, wow, this relates to my message, because that is what the Bible warns us against. Flee from sexual immorality. What if everybody in the world began to put their focus on Jesus? Now, that's our goal. That's what we hope happens. But it would look like 27 million people having freedom, not in captain, not being captive. You see, when we begin to focus on Jesus, we begin to reciprocate his love. And I can't imagine that anybody would not want the love of Jesus in their relationship because Jesus defines love in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, which we talked about recently in our series. But it says, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. Who doesn't want that love? I mean, that is the love that Jesus has given us. It is kind. It is patient. It's not angry. That's the love that I want in my future marriage. But I'm not going to get there unless I'm keeping the one who gives that love in my focus. And I'm not going to be able to give that love if I'm not keeping him in the center. You see, when we begin to look more like Jesus in the Christian walk, we begin to act more like Jesus. And in, in turn of that, we begin to reciprocate more like Jesus. And that love begins to flow out of us. It will flow out into our marriages, into our relationships, into our workplaces, into our friendships. It will flow out into Hollywood. That's what the focus has to be. So then, that's, that's my spill on singles. But let's talk about what about if you find yourself single after being married. Maybe it, maybe it happened through death. Maybe it happened through divorce. And you are broken. You're broken. You don't think that... You ever want to pursue marriage again? You're you're hurting, and you just feel done. Um, wherever that rose is, Brad, could you grab? Could, whoever had the rose, could you just hold it up for me real quick? And Brad, could you? Oh, it's right over here. Could you? Um, if Brad, if you'll bring me that rose, uh, so you just feel like it's over. It's done. You lived your time. You did your time in marriage. You did your time, and now you're single. Um, so what does that look like? When we passed this rose around, um, it was whole, and it was beautiful. It had purpose. And I'm getting it back to me, and there's petals falling off. What did y'all do to my rose? <laughs> this is a representation of what man does. Takes what is whole and continues to break it. I'm not saying men, so ladies, don't start cheering yet because I'm talking about humans do this, not just men. It's humans that do this. They take what is whole and they rip it apart. But according to Psalm 34, 18, I serve a God who says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves save those who are crushed in spirit. Now, that's awesome. I love the fact that Jesus and, and God tells us that in this Psalm, the Lord is near. It's, he's near. But see, God does this incredible thing where he takes it a step further. And in Psalm 147.3, he's not just near, he heals. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He takes this, and when you put your focus on him, when you put your contentment in him, when you say, God, you know what, you're all that I need, and I'm trusting you with my brokenness, I'm trusting you with my shattered heart. I may have been through a lot of pain, but it's yours and I'm turning it over to you. He puts this aside and he turns it back into something new and something beautiful. He gives it purpose again. So don't think that God is a God that can't fix your pain because he defeated death. I mean, we're doing God an injustice if we're saying, yeah, you can defeat death, but I'm not going to give you my broken heart. Jesus will heal you. 
and you will have hope, and you will maybe find love again. Maybe not, but you have to find your contentment in Jesus Christ. And when that happens, everything else is secondary. Everything else is secondary. People are going to let you down. They're going to fail you. But you can have a relationship with somebody that literally will never fail you, always comfort you, always be there, promise to heal your broken heart no matter where you're at in life. So my second point is this, that Jesus heals the brokenhearted. That's not something I came up with. That's what scripture tells us. So it's a promise. It is true. In my life, I've had many, I haven't been married, but I've had relationships fail. And in those moments, man, I just, I felt weak. Um, I felt broken. And I didn't know where to turn sometimes. But when you're at rock bottom, I like to look at it like this. When you're climbing for the climb of life and you fall and you hit rock bottom, Jesus is going to be the only one that continuously reaches his hand down and says, come on, get up. We can do one of two things in that moment. We can decide we're going to lay there and just bleed out. Or we can say, you know what, I'm going to take your hand. I'm going to get up. He's going to help us back up on that mountain and we're going to start climbing again. We have to make that choice just to surrender our pain. Surrender our suffering, surrender everything to Jesus and find our contentment in him. It doesn't matter. I mean, it just, there's so much tragedy in today's world. So much tragedy. But we have the hope of Jesus. So the last thing I want to talk about, I want to talk to married people. I promised I wasn't going to leave you out, so here we go. You might have listened to this entire talk and go, Stephen, that's great, but I'm already married and uh, we're not focusing on Jesus. Let me tell you how to get there. Maybe your spouse isn't a Christian. Maybe they're not interested in being a Christian. What do you do? That starts on your knees. Turning that person over to Jesus. We just saw the promise that he heals the brokenhearted. He has the power to redeem any soul. You got to give it to them. You got to be on your knees fighting for that person, fighting for your spouse. I'm not saying that if you're in a marriage and they're not loving Jesus right now, don't break the commitment of marriage. Get on your knees. Turn that person and push that person towards Jesus. Don't pull them towards yourself. Push them to the Savior. If you push them towards towards the Savior, you're doing everything you can. And it may be the hardest journey you go down. But do it. Because it does work. And we put the people in God's hands, and he's the one that can restore the broken heart. So, maybe you say, well, Stephen, we're, uh, we're married, and we haven't been keeping Jesus in the center of our marriage. That brings me to my third point. Start today. That's it. It's so much more simple than we have to sit and think and and we reflect on it and we go, man, this is tough. And I get it. I'm sure there are a lot of just heartaches going on in this place. There's a lot of brokenness going on in this place. But again, we serve a God that promises in Psalms that he will heal it. But we have to start today. We have to take the action. We can't sit back and just say, you know what, my pain's too great. No, we have to go, Jesus, I'm putting my trust in the Savior, not the person that broke my heart, but the Savior that can heal it. So there's two things, really, that you can do in a marriage that I think will help solve this problem of not keeping Jesus in the center right now. And I think the first one is, like I said, get on your knees. Start praying. Start pushing them towards Jesus. Surrender them to Jesus. Give give your brokenness to Jesus. The second thing is, continue to date your spouse. And ladies, can I please get an amen? Amen. Seriously, guys, though, for real, continue to date your spouse. And here's why, especially as Christians, what is the goal of a Christian is to look more like Jesus every day. Well, if I'm looking more like Jesus every day, then I'm looking less like myself every day, right? And if I'm sitting there and growing in my commitment with re- in my relationship with God, and I'm changing daily, and I'm not intentionally dating the person I'm with, I don't want to wake up one day and look over and see a stranger. And if they're not walking to Jesus with you, then that's a whole other problem. Because you will wake up one day and maybe look over and see a stranger. So, but when you pursue Jesus together and you intentionally date your spouse and continue to get to know them, you may think, oh, I already know everything about them. That's today. But what if they learn something about Jesus tomorrow? 
And they begin to reciprocate that love that we talked about where it's patient, it's kind, it's, it's everything. That's amazing. What happens then, and you don't know everything they know, you need to be intentionally dating that person. You know, so many times people get the thought of marriage and they say, oh man, have you ever heard this? Like, oh, I just, I can't wait to spend eternity with that person. Can't wait to spend forever with that person. And I can tell you right now, there's not a more false statement in the world because you're not going to spend eternity with your spouse. Now, I hope nobody in this room claps when I say that. (laughs) But you're not going to spend eternity with your spouse. As much as you love them, there's nothing you can do that will put you together forever. Who you are going to spend eternity with is your Lord and Savior if you're saved and follow him. And so, (laughs) yes, yes, you're going to spend eternity with your Lord and Savior. And so people get it wrong to begin with, and what they start to focus on is what they want in this world, but what they're not focusing on is what they want after we're out of this world. And that's what Paul is saying, this time is crumbling, it's almost over. We, can, we got to shift our focus from the here and now to the kingdom. And what happens is, is when we find the person and we put that center of Jesus in our relationship, we both should share the mentality that our main goal on this earth is not to love each other, but to love Jesus. And we should take and push each other towards Jesus. And if you're not doing that right now, then start today. The purpose of a marriage shouldn't be so you get gratification. It should be so he gets glorification. The main purpose of a marriage should be this. It should be that you and your spouse are here to expand the kingdom of God together because that's where we're going to end up, with our Savior. And if you don't do that with your spouse, start today. Start putting Jesus in the center of your relationship today. We just sang a song, and the worship team is going to come out. And they're going to lead us in a song again that we just sang. And it's such a perfect example. And it's crazy how God works because this is a total God moment. I didn't pick this song for this sermon. I saw it after. But what a perfect example that says we will build a firm foundation on your love, Jesus. That's not my future wife's love. I'm not going to build my foundation on her. Jesus tells us in Matthew that we have to build our house on rock, not sand. We build our house on sand, we build our marriage on sand, it's going to blow away at the first storm. We build our marriage on a rock, on the foundation of Jesus Christ, who is the rock, it's going to withstand everything. We have to start today. We have to build a firm foundation on the love of Christ, so that way we can begin to look more like him. We can begin to give that love to our future spouse, or to our spouse now. And so... What I want to do is I want to, I want to challenge each and every one of us. Because no matter what we talked about today, there's, there were three things that I mentioned, three groups of people that I addressed, and I promise that every single person falls into one of those categories. But they all have the same thing in common, and that's to keep your focus on Jesus. So it doesn't matter if you're single looking towards marriage, keep it on Jesus. If you're married or were married, you're divorced, keep it on Jesus. And if you're married, keep it on Jesus. And when that happens, it doesn't even matter what you're going through. You're going to get through it because you have a Savior that loves you. So I want to challenge everybody in this room, no matter what stage you're at, start today. If you've been lacking, if you've been slacking, just start today. And so we're gonna, what we're going to do is we're going to go into this song, Build My Life. And man, like I said, what a great, great song for this because it's talking about building your foundation and I want to just encourage you if you feel led the altar is going to be open come down get on your face we talked about it starts on your knees let's let's do it let's do it today but here's another thing you can't get on your knees and turn it over to Jesus if you don't know him so maybe you can't put Jesus in the center of your marriage because you don't know him or your spouse doesn't know him And you're sitting here going, Stephen, that all sounds good, but I don't even know this person you're talking about. I don't even know the very Savior that you're talking about heals the brokenhearted. Start today. Start today. Let the love of Christ come into your heart if you don't know him. And let the joy, the love we talked about, that is patient, kind, doesn't get angry, doesn't envy. Let that love begin to form in your heart and overflow into your relationships. 
So we're going to have, I mean, Brian's going to be up here, Pastor Brad's going to be up here, I'm going to be, we'll, we'll just be down here hanging out. And you guys just come on, pray with us. Get on your face, give your brokenness to Jesus. Or maybe your, your marriage, maybe you should come up here with your spouse and just say, and maybe, maybe you're living it right on. Maybe you're like, Jesus is at the center. Still, get on your face. Because nothing bad can happen when we just continue to turn our lives over to Jesus. So the altar's going to be open. I just encourage you to come. And we'll pray together. And we'll just turn everything over to Jesus and keep our focus right on him. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. And God, I just lift up each and every person in this room. Lord, you know their situation. You know their brokenness. You know their heart. And Lord, I'm just asking that in this moment, Lord, that nobody hesitates to start today. That we let this be the beginning point, the starting line, Lord, of the life that we're going to run towards you. Lord, we ask that you just heal broken hearts. You restore broken hearts, God. We put our trust in you. We put our faith in you. Lord, we love you. It's in your name. Amen. <laughs>